FM podcast with Craig and Karen supporting local bookstores, audiobooks, and more. Join the world of stories. As always, thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to the Libro FM podcast, where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. I'm Karen. And I'm Craig. On today's episode, we got to interview Natalie Nottis, who, if you are an audiobook fan, which I imagine you are if you're listening to this podcast, should ring some bells. Yes, Natalie is an absolute legend in the audiobook world. Um, she has narrated so many beloved favorites. Um, you may have heard of One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. Natalie narrated that, also won a very major award for it. And what you'll learn in today's episode, if you didn't know already, is that Natalie has now written a book as well. So, 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 so talented. Um, <laughs> the book came out on June 4th, 2024. So if you're listening to this right now, you should go buy it at your local bookstore. It is called Gay the Pray Away. It is. And it's absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And of course, Natalie narrated it herself. Who else? Can you imagine if she didn't? <laughs> I think I asked that. I was like, did you ever consider not narrating it? And she was like, what no. You, no. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> like, well, moving on. Yeah, I think this is a really um, interesting interview too because uh, we learned that there are some some parallels between the content of Gay the Prayway and Natalie's life. Um, so it's a really, really important book for her on a lot of levels. And I, I can't wait for all of you to to learn more about that too. Yes, I will play a clip from the book so you can hear Natalie and Gay the Pray Away, and then we will roll the interview. And unlike our last three episodes, this time you can stick around at the end and Karen and I will talk about what we are reading and enjoying right now. Perfect. Are you okay? Should I come in? I'm standing outside the open bathroom door, unsure of what to do. Should I go in and hold her hair? Is that a thing? But her hair is pretty short, isn't it? Ugh, she sounds so miserable. Riley retches again, and then I hear the toilet flush and the sink run. Riley? I peer into the bathroom. Riley comes out, her face pale and sweaty. She crawls into bed, and I bring her the empty ice bucket, just in case, and a cold, wet washcloth. Can I get you anything else? No. I'm so sorry, Riley. I'll be okay. Just dying a little. Was it the chicken? I don't know. If it was, why aren't you sick too? I don't know. I did go to Taiwan a few years ago to see relatives, and I was stupid and drank some tap water and got really sick, but I haven't thrown up since then, so maybe I'm, like, stronger from it? I don't think it works like that. I don't know. Maybe it does. I lie down in the bed beside her. Then I sit up, snatch the room phone from its cradle, and dial my parents' room. Hello? Mom answers. Hi, Mom. Riley is sick. Oh no, what happened? I don't know. She said she didn't feel well and just started throwing up. I glance at Riley. She's curled around a pillow, eyes squeezed shut. How are you feeling? Are you sick too? Mom says. I'm okay right now, but if it's a stomach bug... I'll probably get it too, won't I? I'll send your dad to the vending machine for some Gatorade. What flavor does she prefer? Um, let me ask her. I turn to Riley. What flavor Gatorade do you like? Blue, Riley says so, so sadly. She says blue, Mom. All right, I'll have Dad leave it at your door. Let her know we're praying for her. Check in with me in the morning and let me know how you both are doing. Okay, thanks, Mom. I replace the phone and glance at Riley again. She's still curled up in a ball, bedding crumpled at her feet. I carefully pull the sheet and blanket up, tucking them gently around her. Thanks, Val, she says miserably. You gonna make it? I place my hand on her shoulder and stroke her arm. My fingers itch to move a curl from her forehead, but I stop myself. I think I'll live, Riley sighs. I try not to think about how very sad and still somehow very cute she is. A knock sounds at the door. That'll be my dad. Hello, everyone. We are here today with Natalie Nottis, who is a renowned narrator and an author with a first book coming out soon. Welcome to the podcast, Natalie. Thanks, Karen. 
Um, I would love for you to take a moment to introduce yourself in your own words to our listeners and just share a little bit about what all you have been up to in the the world of books. (laughs) Yeah, I'm Natalie Nautis. I'm a pretty well-known audiobook narrator at this point, I would say. I've recorded over 500 books and I mostly record um, queer fiction of all kinds. And uh, this is my debut novel. We are very excited to talk to you about this. We are huge fans of your work and so excited that you have a book coming out. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. um, You kind of just read right off my script. So (laughs) I was about to say you're a prolific narrator, but you have some big news. You have your own book coming out um, in June. So for our listeners, can you tell us um, what it's about and why we should all be excited about it? Yeah, I kind of timed it with Pride Month on purpose. It's called Gay the Prey Away. Some people are like, what? But it's swapped. It's not Pray the Gay Away. It's Gay the Prey Away. Um, And it's a YA romance about um, a girl who realizes that she is in a Christian homeschooling cult and starts to process that and falls in love with a girl and ends up running away. So it is a romance, but it's also, I would say, um, a love letter to queer fiction and religious deconstruction and self-discovery. So you mentioned that you've narrated 500 books, which is crazy. Most people don't read 500 books, let alone narrate them. Um, What was the experience of narrating your own book compared to um, other people's work? It was easy and hard at the same time. It was easy because I'm so familiar with the material. I wrote it. I went through so many rounds of edits with it. Um, Sometimes I have to stop when I'm recording because I'm not sure where the sentence is going because it's somebody else's brain. But for my own book, that was pretty easy. But it was hard because the subject matter is so personal to me and really came from my own heart and trauma. Um, So I definitely had to take breaks and cry and pet cats and get through it. (laughs) I really love the introduction you included at the beginning, um, talking about why writing this book was so important to you. And you kind of alluded to it just a minute ago, but can you share for um, our listeners what that what that was like? Yeah. So I actually myself grew up in a Christian homeschooling cult, and I didn't really realize it until I was an adult. I was talking to some friends about, um, yeah, we all like burned CDs and satanic toys back in the day, right? And they were like, uh, no, we didn't. And I went and looked up my homeschooling program, which I knew was kind of cult-ish and not the way that I was living now. Um, but it was a bona fide cult. It was the cult that the Duggars were in. Um, there's a documentary, Shiny Happy People, that's out that was the cult that I was in. As I was deconstructing that, I started writing a ragey memoir of sorts. And I realized it was too hard. I would never publish that. It's hard to know (laughs) whose names you're going to include, who you're going to call out. It was too hard. So I wrote this book, which is fiction. The plot did not happen to me, but the setting is something that I'm very familiar with. And the thoughts of going through discovering that you are queer and um, having that baggage of so much religious oppression and working through that. To take this in a little bit of a different direction, I, I love what you're saying about these journeys of self-discovery that are important to the the character in your book. And um, something that I learned about you for the first time really recently is that you actually started out as an opera singer. And I yep. think that's so cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that journey from opera to full-time audiobook narrator and author? <laughs> yeah, I got my undergrad and my master's degree in opera and vocal performance. And I tried really hard to make it work. There is a lot more singers than there are jobs, for sure. I mean, most universities that have a music department have a vocal program. So they're churning out all of these opera singers, and there's really not that many opera houses in the States anymore. Um, And so I was working really hard, doing a lot of auditions. I was traveling a lot for rehearsals, for kind of C-level shows that I was in. And I was listening to audiobooks all the time, feeling really disillusioned with what I'd studied and what I was doing with my life. And then I just looked up, like, how do people become audiobook narrators? And 
I realized that things had changed a lot, that people were recording from home very much. The internet was very much our friend here. And I got on ACX and just started doing it. And I started going to events, meeting producers. And it was so fulfilling. And I was landing work that actually paid. It felt like finally I found an a job in the arts that was loving me back, whereas opera just never did. So I was really happy to make the switch. And I honestly don't miss that kind of toxic relationship I had with opera where I just never felt good enough, was never really making making money or I was teaching more than I was getting paid to perform. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, so it was a great switch. And it actually, I feel like, prepared me super well for audiobook narration with all of the vocal flexibility and text analysis and... Um, being able to sing a three-hour opera sitting in my booth reading all day is not a strain. So I feel like it has been a perfect fit for me. Oh, I love that so much. I was really curious if the the opera training and the the work you had done there carried over in an interesting way because I'm like, technically it's the same instrument that you're that you're using and you've been using your whole life just in a really different way. Yeah. Um how do you take care of your voice? How do you how do you make sure that this instrument <laughs> can keep performing every day? <laughs> I definitely hydrate. I usually sleep with a humidifier to keep things moist and working in good order. I don't smoke. I try not to yell too much. But besides that, a lot of it is more taking care of my body and making sure that I'm stretching and exercising because the recording is so grueling on the body. It's like I'm taking a flight every day. I have to sit so still. So a lot of it is keeping moving and um, taking care of myself holistically. That makes so much sense. And this, this, you might have just answered my question, but when you started narration and got into this world, was there anything that surprised you about it that, that wasn't what you were expecting? I think the biggest thing is that because books are so long, we don't get to rehearse them. Everything else that I'd been a part of, we were memorizing our parts and we were rehearsing and practicing and analyzing and trying each little nuance each little thing in different ways. Whereas with books, we have to essentially read cold. I do prep, but I don't read the whole thing out loud every time. There's no way that I could make a sustainable living doing this if I did that. So it takes a really quick thinking mind to be able to keep looking at the page and think what's the best way to spin this and hopefully get it in the first take because I don't have time to go back and redo every sentence that I'm doing. Um, so it's a lot like extreme cold reading all day, every day. <laughs> that is that so is interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um, you sort of alluded to this when you you said you kind of got into the the um, sector and you started going to like events. And ever since reading Julia Whalen's Thank You for Listening, I've been intrigued by this like narrators insider <laughs> circle world where yeah you know there's the there's the audi awards obviously but we saw on instagram you even went to like a narrator's retreat and i was curious yeah. if you could just give us a little peek behind the curtain of what this community looks like i find that book people are generally just really lovely people and we're not usually tremendous extroverts we're a little quiet and nerdy and i think that makes for great people to hang out with and some of my best friends have come from the narrator community. Um, I would say most of my friends that I talk to like on a daily basis, they're all narrators at this point. And it's it's great to have, you know, a huge thing that we love, books in common, and it leads to having a lot of other things in common too. Oh, that's awesome. And I completely agree. Um, Karen and I get to go to a bunch of book conferences every year and book people mm -hmm. are the best for sure. We've met <laughs> so many nice people. <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely. So speaking of these communities, and this is maybe a slightly touchy subject, but I'm curious with all the AI narration happening right now, what are these conversations looking like with all your, your narrator friends? I assume you guys must be talking about this. Yeah, there's a lot of concern for sure. And it feels like it's kind of coinciding with um, the backlist that felt infinite kind of drying up. A lot of people had full-time work from recording backlist titles that, you know, hadn't been made into audiobooks yet. And so that's kind of running out as we're worried about AI 
taking over a lot of that backlist. So there's definitely concern. I've seen people leave the industry. I've seen people pivot. Um, I'm really lucky that I mostly record um, simultaneous releases, stuff that's coming up. So I haven't seen a hit in my work yet. And I really hope that the front list stuff still goes to human voices. And I think it will. I think that if a project is something that people really care about, it's still going to be going to human voices for a long time, at least I hope. Um, so I'm okay for now, but there's definitely concern in the industry for sure. That's really interesting about the backlist. I didn't really think about that, where if you want to do a book that's 20 years old and you're probably not going to sell a ton of them that they're, yeah. That's the stuff that's going to AI first. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I really love your bio on your website. And I, I wanted to to share this right now, actually, given this conversation. Um, you write that you relish the emotional journey through the book, um, finding a unique and honest voice for each character um, and doing your utmost to honor the words of the author. Um, and I, I really love that because it's it just makes it so clear how important this work is and um, how artistic it is. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about that, like prep or that pre-work that you mentioned a moment ago, you know, when you're getting ready to record something, how do you familiarize yourself with the book and characters and, and make choices around what these people will sound like? Yeah. First, I just read the book <laughs> quietly, you know, not out loud. Um, and I make a list of the characters and, things that are said about them, about their appearance or their personality or the way that they talk. I don't necessarily plan out each voice before I record, but I feel like that gives me a sense of who they are and what I'm going to do. And then there's another consideration, which is how much they talk. Because sometimes if like there's an old man, I'll think, oh, I can give him this great old man voice. But if he talks a ton, like pages long of backstory or giving speeches or whatever, that's going to hurt my voice eventually. So I have to kind of take into consideration a lot of different factors about how much they're talking, who else they're talking with. Are there six old men that I have to be able to differentiate between? And do they talk to each other a lot? Um, things like that. So that's what the prep read helps me get down. And also an idea usually for the main character about kind of the character arc that they go through. And that was something that I felt like was so easy when I recorded my own book that I was able to start kind of so tentative and like introspective and um, scared, honestly, and kind of infuse it with, with an arc, with a growing awareness, growing self-confidence, growing acceptance of self as it goes on. The, these examples are so fascinating to me and thinking about, you know, the old, the old man voice example, um, and the, the dependency of how much does this person actually talk? Have you ever been in a situation where you've had to kind of change your approach to a character or a voice midway through the project? And like, like, what do you do? <laughs> I've definitely gotten into a project and been like, oh, I made a poor choice here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just like allergy season or... Maybe I find out there's a sequel and someone who I thought didn't talk much is like the main character in the next book. <laughs> um, if it's the same book and I know I made a terrible mistake, I'll go back and re-record their lines and drop them in. If it's the next book and the first book was already published and surprise, the wizard talks a ton in this book, I will just modify his book and kind of cheat it towards what's easier on my voice so that I don't hurt myself. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I'm so intrigued by this. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned the old man voice being tough. You know, I mean, I know it was just an example, but are there any characters that when you like open the book for the first time for a new project, like you go like, oh no, like not this kind of voice. Like, is there any like, what's on the like list you're not happy to see? Early in my career, I recorded a lot of reverse harem. And those were hard. Because every time it's like you got four or five guys who are all six foot four, all have low rumbly voices, all are <laughs> macho men. So figuring out how to distinguish between them was always a challenge. I was always like, all right, who can we who can we give like a British accent to? Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to find a way. <laughs> That's funny. Ever since I started at Libro, I have friends being like, I want to get into narration. Do you have any tips? And I'm like, 
I designed the app. Like I, I, I don't know anything about narration. So for my friends and other people that might be listening, um, do you have any tips for, I know you said you just like looked it up, but like, do you have any tips for people? I'm sure you must get asked this by, by folks, but. Yeah. The main thing is to have really strong acting skills and really fast text analysis for sure. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I've always been told I have a great voice. How do I get into audiobooks? But it's so much more than having a nice voice. And in fact, having a unique, quirky sounding voice can be a great career. I mean, we have actors who do children's books and like mm. cartoon voices, and there is a place for every kind of voice. What really is the most important thing is your own acting skills and your ability to turn text into performance. That's super interesting. And I, I feel like we've talked to a few narrators when we, you know, we're researching, looking at their website. A lot of them do also act like in, mm -hmm. in addition to narrating. So that makes total sense. Yeah, it's really an acting job. I wanted to shout out your super cool Patreon. Um, I wanted to make sure that we we told people about this. Um, I understand that you're working with M.H. Gallucci. I, ho I mm -hmm. hope I said that right. Um, uh -huh, to yeah. write and produce sapphic erotic short stories. So um, what can you share with us about that that work? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I write, along with my girlfriend, stories that are all spicy and all sapphic, and we release one every month on my Patreon. And it's just a cool way to for people to support sapphic stories, and then we're going to bundle them together and um, release them as short story anthologies. Oh, I just, I'm in a lot of sapphic fiction groups, and I always saw people being be like, I'm in a lot of sapphic fiction groups, and I always saw people say, what's the spiciest read that you have? What gets, <laughs> what's definitely spice in every chapter? And that's not a normal book trajectory. You know, romance will have like a spicy scene. So yeah. we are taking it upon ourselves to fill that gap. Yes. Well, thank you for your work. <laughs> all spice all the time. I love it. <laughs> uh. Um, so we have a kind of silly portion of the podcast now that we call the lightning round where we have gathered some very short rapid fire questions for you that, you know, don't, you don't need to think about them too much. It's just to okay. learn a little bit more about you. <laughs> and I think okay. uh, Craig has the first one. I wrote this question before I realized you've narrated 500 books. So I have no idea if you even read for pleasure or if have, you even have the time. But what book is your go-to reread um, for comfort, like a comfort book? Sputnik Sweetheart. Haruki Murakami. You had that ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, who is your favorite character you've ever gotten to voice and why? Oh, that's a hard one. There was this character in a series um, by Deborah Wolf, and her, her name was Hafsa Azena, I think. And I gave her this like really like hoarse, badass old lady voice. <laughs> and I, I use it all the time. And I write... <laughs> The character's name, Hafsa Azena, down when I to bookmark that in whatever book I'm recording. So I would say she's probably my favorite. She comes up a lot. That was very cool to hear and see yeah. at the same time. <laughs> I was actually wondering about that earlier. I was like, with narrating so many characters, when a sequel comes up, like you must have to go back and listen. Like, how did I voice this character? Or or apparently mm -hmm. you can just pull it out of your your head very easily, but I have a lot of lists for sure. And I'll save yeah. samples too, but mostly at this point, I can write myself a little shortcut and it makes sense to me, but wouldn't make sense to anyone else. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I've heard from other narrators that there's like tricks for being able to like talk for multiple hours. Someone told us they like eat an apple. I was curious, do you have any like special tricks that work for you? No, I think it's just the opera training, honestly. Mm. Um, I did a little e-stalking and I see that you are a fellow crocheter and I am curious, what's the coolest thing you've ever crocheted? <laughs> All I've made are blankets, but they're really fun because I'm making them for my kids and my sisters and everyone is special to each child or adult sister. So I guess that special personalized blankets in colors people are picking out. What is a memorable mistake that you've made while recording? I remember saying reindeer instead of deer one time, and it was close to Christmas, so I think it was just on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You're like, there's a plot twist in this book now. <laughs> Do accidents like that ever make it into the final recording? Like you didn't realize you said it and then 
you ship the files off and then someone's like, why was there a reindeer in chapter eight? Yes, it does happen. And sometimes <laughs> we'll get emails and we'll be like, shoot, I, I, the proofer didn't catch it. I missed it. <laughs> the editor didn't catch it. Oh, man. Um, my last question for you is a would you rather. Um, would you rather narrate a book with 50 different characters or with one character? 50, for sure. Really? Why is Can that? Can you tell us more? Yeah. <laughs> Just keeps me engaged, switching voices. Only one character the whole time? I don't know. It depends on how good the writing is, I guess. Mm. <laughs> awesome. So you've made it through lightning round. Our last thing before we pester you for book recommendations is Instagram story time, where we stalk your Instagram and choose a photo to get more information about. Okay. Um, so the photo that I found to ask you about is from January 26th of 2023. And you are outside with a really cool looking machine and a bunch of solar panels. And it sounds like this is for recording. And you say you're in an idyllic mountain, on an idyllic mountain. <laughs> um, can you tell us more about this this setup and this awesome solar machine? <laughs> yeah, it's a power bank, which is charged by solar. So when I lose power, I can switch over to solar and keep working for the afternoon. Oh, very cool. And is that where you are right now in the space you're in today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in the shed and we do lose power up here pretty frequently. So being able to switch to a backup is great. That's very cool. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I you can scroll way back. <laughs> yes, we, we did our homework. <laughs> I can, I just can't imagine the horror of being in the middle of a recording or something, then everything shuts off. Like that seems traumatizing. So <laughs> it happens more often than you would think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I think um, that kind of brings us to the end of our our meatiest questions for you. Um, but before we let you go, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't ask if you have any book recommendations for us. You know, anything you're, you've recently read and enjoyed that you would you would like to tell other people to go read. I really, really enjoyed um, "Interesting Facts About Space" by Emily Austin. I just found it so interesting and thoughtful and unusual. I loved it. I'm so excited. <laughs> the description, there's no way to really explain. Like, she has a fear of bald men. Like, it's just, she calls her mom and gives her interesting fact about space. It's just one of those books that I'm not sure if what's happening is important, but how we're getting there is very interesting. The other book I would really recommend is Gray Dog by Elliot Gish. One of the best books I've ever read. It's such a slow burn horror novel. And I just hope people read it because it's a slow start, but it builds and builds to this crazy conclusion that was so satisfying to record. And I can't recommend it enough. So, so sold. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to go get both of these. <laughs> you had me at horror. <laughs> So that is it. We um, thank you so much for making the time. And I, I'm sure you have a million things going on. So we really appreciate you sitting down with us. Thank you for having me. I had a great time talking to you. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks. <laughs> We are so excited you could join us for that interview with Natalie. Um, I hope you learned as many mind-blowing things as I know I did, and I think Craig did as well. Um, I guess before we head out, we would like to talk a little bit about what we are reading and enjoying. And Craig, I would like for you to go first this time. Me to go first? I've been, yeah. I've been bamboozled. I hope you're um, ready. I've been reading multiple things um, in paper format. I found out that one of my favorite silly, scary movies was a book. And I've seen this movie. Oh, I'm, I'm burying the lead. Um, it's called The Ring. You may have heard oh, of it. I, I have, in fact, heard of that. You've heard so. of The Ring. Yes. So <laughs> yes. I have loved The Ring since I was a wee lad. And I've seen it a million times. And I love the original Ring You movie as well. The other day I watched both back to back because I have a problem. And then I wikipedia after the fact, and I was like, wait, this was a book? And it's old, so I had to go onto the eBay to get this book. Nice. Came in the mail, devoured it in one day. Quite different. 
very different than the movie. Interesting. Um, but it's good. It's a very page turner book. It's a it's not horror, not really anyway. It's much more mystery, who done it, um, thriller, um detect there's lots of detective work. There's lots of like tracking down leads and which is part of the movie, but the movie is much more focused on the scary bits of it. This is I think if you were a scaredy cat, you could read this book. There were definitely parts of it that I didn't love. I won't say more, um, but there are some triggering trigger warnings. Yes, for sure. Around um, assault and other things um, that I don't think added to the story. Personally, I don't think they had to be in there. But if you can get past that, it's a it's a good quick read. Um, especially if you're really into the ring um, or or in general. So I read that in a day, which was great. And then uh, Eric Laraca yeah. oh. got that got that got that one that you told me to read. And then I've picked up like two since then. So I've been on a tear. I am so glad I got you on the Eric Laraca train with me. He is so talented and. I just, I love, it's I love so his, creepy. I, I love yeah. the horror. He, he writes great horror. Yeah. The other day I was like walking um, out of my office and I saw that the booksmith was having Eric Loraco like there that evening. And I was like going to walk in and then I saw that it was sold out and I was the saddest little Eric Loraco fan. But <laughs> next time, next time, what are you reading right now? Oh, I am so excited to talk about this. I am reading a book that I could not be enjoying more. It is called Sucker by Daniel Hornsby. This book came out almost exactly a year ago. It was like July of 2023. So it's, you know, still pretty new. And it is, oh, how to describe it? It's a satire, a modern day satire about uh, a place that you may know of called Silicon Valley. Um, no, and what, what's that? <laughs> That's like that TV show, right? No, <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> and it is specifically a satire of a very well-known tech company that faced quite a great deal of litigation. And I think is still facing litigation. Uh, I will not say any more, but it is, um, an amazing, kind of speculative satirical rendering of what was actually going on at this shady, shady company. I don't want to say much more because I don't want to ruin it. But I want you to say more because I'm interested. <laughs> like the, the main character is really fascinating. His name is Chuck Gross, and he is the heir to um, a very like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk type character, like a like a mega billionaire. Um, and he I can't believe you just said those names on this podcast. I know, I know. That might be um, the first time that the the J word has ever been said on the <laughs> WePro podcast, and I am not here for it. Well, uh, I'll, ble- I'll bleep not, it out in post. This person is not depicted in a flattering light in this book. So, uh, <laughs> but the main character feels like really bad about who he is by default of, you know, who his father is. And sure. He's kind of tried to bury that for a long time. He is the founder of a really like kind of punk rock underground record label. Um, but he gets sucked into this weird world of Silicon Valley because of a college friend and all kinds of crazy stuff starts happening. I absolutely love it. I haven't been able to put it down. Um, the audiobook It sounds amazing. It's it's wonderful. The audiobook is fantastic. It's narrated by Graham Halstead, who I absolutely love. Um, so you you just really can't go wrong with whichever way you want to read this one. And as I say, every episode, you know where I'll be going right after we record? The bookstore. Amen. Our next episode, which we are so excited to share with you all, is with the wonderful writer of many great horror books, Stephen Graham Jones. Yes, I actually just finished his new book, I Was a Teenage Slasher. So good, just like every other Stephen Graham Jones book. And also, I love when he joined the call. You and I were like, this is going to be a good one. He had like a Stephen King hat on and like a scream mask behind him and like horror paraphernalia. He was, we were on the same wavelength. So he had a cool office. I mean, thousands of books. I I want to live in that office. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, my office feels very uncool after that call. So I have some <laughs> upgrades to make. 
So we hope you enjoyed this episode and will join us for the next one, which comes out in just a couple weeks. So awesome. Well, just as a reminder, we would love it if you could subscribe to the podcast. Feel free to share it. Tell a friend. We love reviews and ratings. And most importantly, if you haven't signed up for a LibroFM membership yet, you can use the promo code SWITCH and you will get three audiobooks for your first month of membership instead of just one. And as always, thank you for listening. 